der Vortrag, den wir jetzt hören werden, ist was ganz Besonderes. Es war schon bei der ersten Sitzung, die wir mit dem ZKM zusammen hatten, da sagte Frau Riedel, da habe ich jemanden, nämlich Professor Weizmann, der in einer einzigartigen Weise zeigt, wie Kunst in der digitalen Welt Verantwortung übernimmt mit digitalen Mitteln. Al Weizmann ist Professor für Raum- und Bildkulturen an der Goldsmith University of London und Leiter der interdisziplinären Rechercheagentur Forensic Architecture. Mit dem Projekt Forensic Architecture waren Sie 2016 auf der Architekturbiennale in Venedig und 2017 auf der Documenta 14 in Kassel. Die Zeitschrift Monopol schreibt zu Forensic Architecture, Forensic Architecture ist so etwas wie eine architektonische Detektivagentur. Sie untersucht mit visuellen Methoden Behördenversagen und Verstöße gegen die Menschenrechte. Auf der Documenta 14 machte sie mit einer Rekonstruktion des NSU-Mordes seit der Nomin äh, Furore und seit der Nominierung für den Turner-Preis ist sie endgültig im Rampenlicht der Kunstwelt angekommen. Mr. Weizmann, we are honored to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to address uh, an audience like that in a kind of a workshop environment because it seems like we're all thinking about the same thing, how to mesh not only digital work and culture, but science uh, and culture toward, uh, towards real objectives uh, in the world. And I think that when we set up forensic architecture back in 2010 at Goldsmiths, these were the discussions uh, that were around. Um, I myself coming from, uh, I was a, I'm still a writer, um, coming from a department of visual cultures, um, and uh, there was just beginning um, this, what is called uh, in UK Academy, the digital turn in humanities, um, science studies, and other things. And we were thinking how to comment upon these and came across uh, the idea quite haphazardly to start a forensic agency, but a forensic agency that would regard the production of truth in a different way. In fact, if you would ask me a decade and a half ago, or you would tell me that I would end up running a forensic agency, I would probably have reached for a five kilo hammer and kind of like smash that prospect. Uh, because coming from humanities, coming from crit critical cultures, etc., we were all oriented uh, against the certainty of truth, against the institutions of authority and other things. So what has happened? I think for us, it was a combination of uh, two uh, larger uh, conditions. One of them is the availability of information and the availability of digital processing tool. And the other was a certain problem in the political texture of our present. And that is to say, a culture by which right-wing popular regimes are mobilizing an attack against truth statement. So the kind of post-truth era, um, some would say is nothing new. Uh, lying in politics is a condition of politics, obviously. Um, but it has a different method and it has a different uh, way of operating. Um, an attack on verification is not simply an attack on this or that statement. It is not an argument about facts, but it is an attempt to destroy the way facts are being produced. And with them, it is an attack on the institutions of authority that buttress truth claim. May there be courts or uh, think tanks or you know, government agencies, universities, etc. And um, one of the responses to this particular problem, one of kind of the knee-jerk reaction, is to establish again those big arbiter of truth, those institutional authorities say, actually, we need that kind of truth in the world today. And, but I think that our answer in forensic architecture is slightly different. It's like, let's think about truth production in a different way. Let's think about a new aesthetics effect 
Let's talk about uh, the way in which truth and uh, truth production is socialized, uh, is acting in relation between multiple disciplines, in which uh, new institutions and new kind of skills are entering into a field that I call open verification. So the old-fashioned verification would be a person of authority or an institution of authority would render a particular judgment on a case and, and we would believe that based on that authority. Open verification is a much more contingent relation between practitioners that are diffused in space and time. I'll go back to that at the end, but I'll start showing you what I mean. And back in uh, last April, uh, we all were, we all heard, so about a year ago, um, that the um, Syrian government was using um, chemical uh, munitions against its people in Douma. Uh, the international response was, uh, was uh, quite strong, and immediately the Russians, who were the first journalists to arrive on site, the site with two canister, yellow canister were found on a balcony in Douma, part of Damascus, came there and said, you see, this is all fake. This is a fake manufactured by the CIA and the British Secret Services. Uh, and in fact, those canisters were not dropped from the air, i.e. by the Syrian forces, but brought from the ground, i.e. by the rebels. In fact, the problem was diagrammatically simple. If the canisters were dropped from the air, the only people that controlled the air were Russians and Syrians. If it was brought from the ground, the only people on the ground were the opposition. And that was the question, and this is where uh, the Russian news agency here claims that this attack was fake. So what we do when we work with image practitioners, with people that are used to um, modeling and used to analyze and edit uh, videos, is to interrogate that site. So here, uh, we're building a 3D model based on the photographs that was provided for us by the Russians. The Russians having recorded it, the camera caught more details than they were aware of. Uh, so we're looking at all sorts of things initially that would prove that that canister came from the, or would support the fact that it came from the air, and that is uh, initially some architectural uh, dense in, um, in, in on site that would show us that here we have a trajectory in which this thing uh, could have fallen uh, down. Then we turn our attention into the other things that we see on site. So we see um, a certain bit of um, uh, fencing that came from above that if we use and open up, we see would have fit exactly the top of the um, balcony, again supporting but not proving the fact that something came gravity-wise onto the site. Here, RT is the, one of the main propaganda channels of the Putin regime, is actually giving us a shot that they did not know what it, what it means of some uh, twisted metal. Using open source software, we are able to untangle that twisted metal and see what is uh, existing within it. And we could see that uh, harness, that when you are actually measuring it and, and untangling it, gets to a form that supports um, the form of something that is the fins on which the chemical munition uh, would have fallen uh, to the ground. And we could actually measure and see they precisely fit the size of this chlorine canister. Uh, so again, we have indicating evidence to it. Um, now we need, we cannot go on site. The Russians and Syrians control it. The only thing we have to work with are the images that they themselves have taken to prove the opposite of what we claim. Um, so we need to create something that is closest to the material aspect of that canister. We take images from all sides. Again, we're using digital tools to create um, the object in an almost tactile manner and use it also in order to look at it very carefully and see what kind of evidence exists on that piece itself. What we can learn by reading very carefully uh, what is there. So we see a certain charring uh, on here on the top of this canister. We go uh, online and we see that indeed um, all other 
chemical strikes had the same kind of chairing uh, at the top, and we see a deformation. A deformation, again, would support the fact that this thing got a very strong impact while falling. Again, another indication that this was dropped from the air rather than from the ground. But here is the most interesting piece of information. We see a certain grid on, uh, on, the, on the model itself, and we are able to untangle the fence and see that the grid that was imprinted on the canister is exactly the same dimension as that uh, which is uh, on the fence itself and uh, supporting, again, a kind of um, uh, a residue, a kind of like a, a effect, a material effect uh, of impact. We can even see the threading of those uh, elements. But with it came also a difficulty. Uh, if you look at the top of the canister here, what we are seeing are drainage signs. So something as uh, when, when chemical weapons are being used, as they release their gas, they're freezing all along the canister, and then after they release the gas, they would defreeze, and the liquid would actually drain on it. But something very strange happened with this draining sign, they're pointing upwards. And draining sign should obviously um, um, water uh, drain downwards. So you see that kind of very strange pattern. So we can say two things looking at this canister. One, it was dropped from the air. This is a Syrian weapon. Two, the people on the ground, possibly the victims, possibly the, the people that were um, arrived first on site and might be uh, those, have turned it 180 degrees. Why they've turned it, we do not know. But we need to be suspicious of everything that we see online and our independence here is to say those two things. Yes, as the Russians are claiming, there has been a tampering with the evidence, but no, that tampering does not exclude that thing coming uh, from, uh, from the air. Here is another piece of um, chemical weapon analysis that... In October 2017. Oh, sorry. A joint? Yeah, okay. Um, in 2017, uh, we, we were actually working on another chemical strike uh, in Syria, in uh, Han Shaikun, uh, and we were able to produce the very detailed analysis of the crater, very small crater, uh, from which uh, sarin gas, not chlorine, like before, was coming, that was used by Human Rights Watch and the UN, and, um, and, and you know, that was contested by the, by the Russians and Syrian government. Uh, in fact, the way of contesting our fines was the Russian Foreign Office making a press release and showing our, our model of the, uh, of the uh, crater. And he's actually saying, now let me show you our bombs. Our bombs are bigger than this crater. So he's giving, and it was kind of an unbelievable moment, uh, military secrets uh, to contest it with precise dimension uh, of the bomb. Only unfortunately for the Russians, we could find other instances where that particular bomb we didn't know about and we didn't know its dimensions uh, could be, uh, were used uh, around. So we pick up all sort of little elements from, um, that were found in sites. And just like an archeologist building an old pot, uh, we're trying and starting to build the kind of, um, um, we build a model from the, the, the drawings that the Russian Foreign Ministry is actually giving us uh, of that bomb. And now we'll try to match into it each and every bit of crumped metal. Again, untangling it, measuring it, and then uh, we are able to um, locate those things Oh, sorry. And then we're able to kind of untangle them and locate each one of those elements um, within our model and absolutely prove uh, with information that was simply granted to us as a gift by the Russian government uh, that uh, they were using uh, their own manufactured uh, chemical strike uh, weapon uh, in Syria. So here is almost a kind of a, a combination of the traditional role of an archaeologist that looks at bombs like, you know, like you look at an old sculpture or at, a, at an old pot, piece it together 
and digital kind of uh, knowledge based on also a kind of a critical examination of the media of those people that you investigate. Uh, many times people are actually giving you much more information uh, uh, that is uh, you know, advisable uh, for them if I would be uh, in their place. So thank you to this press conference. Um, another situation that we are researching very uh, intensely with an organization called Forensic Oceanography with us uh, is the situation in the Mediterranean and to do with European policy of taking NGOs, rescue NGOs, out of the sea so that people uh, would not be rescued and brought into European shores. Uh, we're particularly working with two German NGOs, one of them called Jungen Rettet, that uh, has been, uh, the boat was confiscated, and together we developed uh, means opa, to um, use the kind of videos that they take to create a kind of uh, what we call um, uh, counter radar or visual radar uh, that allows us to actually understand what is happening at sea. Usually the sea is the most complicated forensic space because the sea leaves no traces. Uh, unlike uh, a, a balcony somewhere in Syria, uh, you, whatever happens on the sea is covered again by the waves. But there's a lot of digital traces that are left, and we could create a kind of the digital spatiality of the sea. Here uh, is an image of the Italian prosecutor claiming that this German NGO is uh, people smugglers. Uh, what they are saying here is those people from uh, the Juventa boat uh, of this NGO are dragging back, so these are the NGO people, they say they're dragging back this migrant boat. After successfully rescuing people stranded at sea, they're dragging back to the Libyan coast. Therefore, they're people smugglers. Therefore, they will confiscate their boat. Indeed, they just don't want them to operate there. But what in this image indicate to us which direction the boat is being towed? How can we believe the Italian prosecutor for what they say? Well, again, the consequence was that was that, that the German NGO boat was con was uh, was confiscated, and uh, here is how we start looking at images like that. Indeed, there is no direction that is evident in this image except perhaps the waves. So the smallest of all details, if you um, track it, uh, motion track it you can start creating, as I'm sure you'll all do, a digital model of the ocean in that particular water consistency, direction, and flow. And you can start examining the waves into what uh, they tell us, and then going into um, open source uh, information about meteorology uh, at the time. You can look at what was the direction of the wind and what was the direction of the waves at that particular day, uh, which we've done, and uh, it actually, uh, when you examine it, you see that the boat was actually towed away from Libya, uh, or was towed northwards. So, uh, again, a combination of ocean scientists, uh, artists, filmmakers, NGO people, uh, create a new diagram of truth statement that is not the kind of the institutional authority uh, of old. Sometimes you don't have any images at all, as in this most notorious prison run by Assad in Syria called Sadnaya. Uh, we were asked by Amnesty International to interview uh, five witnesses, the survivors of this prison. Um, others are executed there, starved to death, or tortured in this place. The problem was that those witnesses, we had no images, and even they haven't seen the space. They were led there blindfolded, and all we had was their memory of the sound, their memory of how many steps they've gone, and when they were in the cell, they could uh, open their eyes, and although it was very dark, they could see something. Here we develop a technique called situated testimony by which building architectural models become a doorway into memory, uh, because when they are building very um, simple and minute things, sometimes the memory uh, erupts, uh, as you would see uh, in this case. Uh, we need sound, sorry. 
اوكي وهذا ايش ايش في تحت على هذا الارتفاع؟ نفس هي الشراقه اللي سم... نفس الشيء اللي سميناه طاقه، شيء تحت بسموه شراقه. بقى على قد ايه عرضها؟ عرض So you would see that the interviewer is a Palestinian woman that works with us. Ask him only, she never asked him about the experience of being there. Only very technical details about the door, about the dimension, about what it is, and she tries to model it. And those, this precision, and through those architectural models, the most horrific of recollection so, would emerge. بشعره. وهذا ارتفاعها وعرضها بالنسبة للباب يعني يعني هاي الباب. لا هي عرضه أنا عم بحكي عن عرضه ما عم بحكي. هي الباب تمام. أوكي. إذا قلنا هي الباب هي هون صاير على ارتفاع 30 سنتي هي عريضة هي مستطيلة تمام ليش أكبر بالعرض لأنه أنا هي واحدة من العقوبات اللي تعاقبتها جوا هي إني يطلع راسي من قلب هي الطاقة ويندعس علي راسي يعني هلا إذا هلا خليني أنا أرسم لك وشي هون مرة من المرات نحن إجا السجان طلب هيك طلب قال ليش ما نضيف الزنزانة تكون؟ لأنه نحن ما عندنا مواد، نحن عالم جرباني، نحن عنا ما عندنا مي، نحن عنا ما عنا ما عنا أي وسيلة لحتى نقدر نضيف الزنزانة. قال لي مد راسك. أو أنا ما فهمت. قال لي مد راسك. قلت له من وين؟ قال لي مد راسك من هون. عم انا قلت لحالي اكذب قلت له ما بيطلع هو فعلا راسي بالطول ما بيطلع قلت له ما بيطلع قال بالعرض بيعرف حاله انه بالعرض بيطلع لا فعملت هيك ففعليا انا وقت عملت هيك راسي بالعرض مرق بالعرض بال... يعني وقت صار العرض تبع راسي هو الطول الطبيعي وبعد ما طلعته بالعرض رجع جلس لي اياه بحيث صار جوزه تحلقي على زي ال هي هذا الزيت تبع الشراقه بسموه انا صار راسي برا ونط هيك بكل وزنه بكل وزنه نط So I spare you the rest of the testimony but you could see that the models that you see here are not representation that are done after the fact they are tools with which to induce memory and allow people who are too traumatized to arrive at these memories to get uh, and discuss those things uh, that was um, published quite widely, and Assad was asked to respond to our analysis and discovery of the architecture and what was happening. The report in this prison. that you, you have mentioned That's what he it had was to a say. report made by Qatar and financed by Qatar. Uh, you don't know the source, you don't know the names of those victims. Nothing verified about that report. It was paid by Qatar directly in order to verify. So this is uh, an absolute kind of example of what is this culture of post-truth. An attack on verification, an attack on the funders. In fact, we didn't get any money from Qatar, though we would be happy to. Um, but um, the, the idea that you can just effectively, as a leader or somebody in political power, just dismiss the truth and the way of its making uh, completely out of hand. Um, I think I have... Very little time, but I'm going to show you another last investigation that we've done onto uh, allegation of American uh, presence in a Cameroonian um, special forces base where terror suspects have been also executed uh, and tortured. So you see that we're not only working on that side of one side of the conflict. Um, and in fact, uh, we could not get any confirmation of that until at one point, we tracked an American service personnel who opened, who had a Facebook account, and on his Facebook account, you know, usually Facebook is spying on us, but now Facebook allows us to spy back at the American army. Uh, he's posting images of him chilling out in some places, and we could, we build an architectural model, we could locate each one of those and show exactly uh, where that person was by matching the photograph onto the model and that allowed us to, um, to confirm, sorry, um, that um, first of all, we could see the base is growing, and then we could see that here uh, an American Special Forces uh, instructor is actually teaching Cameroonian soldiers. Uh, just behind the, this building here is the building where torture is actually taking place. 
Uh, the American claim no knowledge of that and no, no presence in it. It's going to be very hard for them to confront that. Uh, they had to open a full investigation here. American service personnel are playing football with the Cameroonians. Uh, so this is really uh, the way uh, it worked in that case. I think a lot of you probably know about our NSU case. Uh, I don't have really, with six minutes, I don't, there's not enough time to do justice to it. Um, you know that um, uh, the killing of Halit Yozgat uh, in April 2006 happened uh, in an internet cafe that's the front part of it. Halit Yozgat was sitting here. Uh, two Nazis came in and shot him in the head while a Verfassungsschutz agent was sitting right here uh, at the back. When questions were asked, uh, a kind of a, a gagging order and for 120 years was put on the file. What did the Verfassungsschutz agent do there? I think all of this uh, you know well. What we did was to take a leak where the police documents were actually leaked and to reconstruct, in fact, uh, the entire situation. We needed a 3D model of this place. That place doesn't exist. It's a honey shop these days. Uh, so we took the police um, photograph and actually matched them into a very precise 3D model of, uh, of the room. And uh, after that, we actually, uh, together with the House of World Culture in Berlin, which produced some of that work, again, you see a kind of the diagram of verification, activists on the ground, uh, civil society, the family members of uh, Halit Yozga, an art institution, a science institution in London, artists doing reenactment, that diagram is a kind of a new form of knowledge production that I think is relevant uh, today. Uh, building a one-to-one -one model would have been very expensive without the full dedication of the House of World Culture uh, in Berlin. And uh, in fact, the kind of the entire reenactment of Andreas Temer here, the Verfassungsschutz agent. Uh, again, I'm not able to go into it, but we needed to reenact his movement in space within the model that, that we've built. And um, actually look also, you know what, I'm going to... Mr. Weizmann, you've got every, all the time you need, so... Is that true? Yeah, you have time. All uh, the time we, we, Well. Okay. The keynote speakers have all the time. We got you here from okay. London, so it's okay, not wonderful. it's not time for pressure. So all relax right. and show you every show show us everything. Okay. Um, we need to be aware of what you wish for. But <laughs> okay. So uh, here is the um, also again working with scientists. The architects build a model. The, the video people did the visual analysis, convert it into model. Here, fluid dynamic scientists make a simulation, a fluid dynamic simulation of what happened to the smell of ammonia in, uh, after a single gunshot and how long it lingers in the air uh, because a crucial element of the testimony of the Verfassungsschutz was, I didn't hear, I didn't smell, and I didn't see the body of Halit Yozgat. So effectively you construct this space as a sensorium, as a kind of uh, testing the limits uh, of, uh, of the sensors. Um, maybe an interesting thing is also working with a computer designer, game designer we heard before, uh, was very useful. Uh, we motion tracked the eyes of Andreas Temer as he reenacts, as he reenacts his movement through space. Now, Many, very few people believe that his reenactment is correct. But we need to assume that Andreas Temer reenactment of how he moved through space and did not see a body that was lying under the counter is the best case scenario for him. It's, uh, reenactment is a testimony of the body. And in fact, here, the reenactment is potentially the crime. Usually, in criminal cases, reenactment is a representation of a crime. Here the crime, potentially, of perjury happens on camera. So what we do, we motion track his eyes and we could see in the model on the right what he sees, uh, uh, what, uh, where, where his eyes are directed here on the, on the left. And you could see that uh, at the moment he put the coin, at least the body would have been uh, in his full view. Again, just going into that principle 
of uh, open verification. Sometimes we are presenting in court. We are advising the International Court in The Hague. We are presenting in courts in Britain, in other places worldwide, in Israel, where I come from, uh, mainly human rights cases of Israeli police shooting against Palestinians or bombing in Gaza. Um, we are presenting in courts. Sometimes the kind of evidence that we bring, which we call counter forensics, i.e. it is about police crime or it is about state crime, cannot go to court. And in cases like that, it is extremely important to insist on the forms of the art and cultural spaces as forms of public display of evidence, of discussion about the facts of our history and um, the controversies we live through, uh, and insist that art perhaps too long has been understood as a license to fictionalize, but art, another part of it, is to insist on its evidentiary value and insist on aesthetics as an epistemological necessity. Aesthetics is to do with the senses, with what we can hear, what we can see, what we can smell. In fact, opposite of all that uh, address them, claim he's anesthetized, you know, like when you have, when you go to have an operation, you're anesthetized. To anesthetize is the opposite of aesthetics, is a to numb the senses. The aesthetic regime, the aesthetic institutions, aesthetic practitioners are incredibly important in augmenting our capacity to understand the world in which we live and to present it. And indeed, a very modest presentation in the Documenta exhibition, which is in Kassel, um, very, very small, very much to the side, attracted so much attention, this 20 square meter with a video, uh, that indeed it was able to open up the process in Hessen, in the Untersuchungskommission in uh, Wiesbaden, I think, uh, where the material that was first presented in an art context, produced by an art institution, went into there and uh, in fact, Andres Temme himself was forced by the Untersuchungskommission to watch that art piece. And of course, that led to um, the CDU uh, delegation to the Untersuchungskommission to say, just like Assad, the Russians, uh, the Israelis or Americans, this is fake news. Uh, why? Because it was in the art. Because their understanding, the traditional understanding of the art is a place of fictionalization rather than a, a, an epistemological laboratory. And I think standing here at the ZKM at a place that did most uh, as, um, as, as an art institution to turn the gallery into a kind of a thinking laboratory uh, that is almost an offensive uh, kind of accusation. That is fake, being an artist, in fact, we had the Verfassungsschutz review our documents, pointing to those people in our team. We had scientists, lawyers in our team, pointing to those people in our team that were artists and saying, you see, that is the proof that that was uh, fake. But I think that uh, it is absolutely essential to revive art and culture uh, precisely when the art of lying occupies the center of power the practice of truth must find its place uh, in the gallery. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Weisman. I glaube, we have a very interesting Vortrag gehört, der gezeigt hat, dass die Idee der Kunst als Ort des wahren, schönen und guten in digitalen Zeiten auch neu gedacht werden muss. Auch die Rolle des Künstlers, die wir schon jetzt mehrfach diskutiert haben. Es war wieder ein sehr gehaltvoller Vortrag, der den Kunstbegriff sicher auch aufwirkt, auch wiederum den Verantwortungsbegriff. Welche Verantwortung übernimmt Kunst in der Gegenwart, die sonst andere Institutionen übernommen hatten? als Garant für Wahrheit, ein hoher Anspruch an die Kunst, der auch schon gestellt wurde, allerdings äh, immer wieder auch bezweifelt wurde. Wir haben jetzt wieder das System der Diskussion am Tisch und danach der Fragemöglichkeit. Ich würde vorschlagen, dass wir diese Diskussionen jetzt auf fünf Minuten in dem Fall 
beschränken und dann dafür vielleicht in einer größeren Runde noch mehr diskutieren können. Die Diskussion an den Tischen ist okay. eröffnet. Wie gesagt, in dieser Runde ist jeder äh, dazu aufgerufen, Fragen zu stellen. Es ist nicht auf die Tischmoderatoren beschränkt, äh, außer Sie haben sich entsprechend abgestimmt. Ich bin gespannt auf Ihre Fragen. Uh, just a short question. Why you use the context of art? Is it not much better to use the court in Den Haag, for example, or uh, to present it there? Is it just the last place where you can go with your researches, or is it What's the reason to, to, to use the context of art? So first, I mean, it's a very good question. And first of all, I, I'm not, we're not only using the context of art. I, I would say most of our cases are going to human rights court, human rights investigation, etc. What I showed you today, because of the context of this uh, investigation, is how the art could be actually useful for us. And, and indeed, very pragmatically, sometimes, Let's say in Israel, I cannot bring my things uh, to always to court because the legal system is perhaps part of the problem, um, especially when we're talking about occupied uh, West Bank and Gaza. They, they simply do not uh, run on that. Now, this, the root of the, of the word forensics comes from the Latin forum. So forensics is the art of the forum. And the forum, as it was understood, in the first century was not the legal forum at all. Uh, the political forum, the cultural forum, or the forum is the, the kind of the public domain uh, of uh, ideas and exchange. And I think that we need to take forensics out of its specialized bureaucratic context and place it back, politicize it, place it back with the public as, as making a kind of, a, um, as a way of making a claim. This is one thing. Second is that absolutely we need the aesthetic practitioners, photographers, video um, uh, editors, and filmmakers to work with us because the majority of evidence that we analyze now are film. Uh, and the aesthetic sensibility of artists is absolutely crucial for our work. Uh, they're able to see things perhaps that other people cannot. They're able to understand the way the video works, the frame ratio, the blare. Uh, etc. So pe a lot of people that were thinking and working critically with media uh, allow us uh, to gain understanding that very traditional forensic institutions are unable to, um, uh, to gather. And I think that this is something we we're discussing on our table. Arts and sciences were very connected, say, in modernity from the 15th, 16th century onwards. Uh, artists and natural scientists were working hand in hand in the task of describing the world. They were creating a certain common, a common perception of, um, of the world, of nature, as they were describing it to be. And then started the specialization. In the 18th uh, century, there was a house for science, and there was a house for art that was subjectivity versus objectivity where expression, individuality uh, could be expressed and where it should be kept out of. And there was needed to be a very strict and very strong wall between those two domains. Uh, and I think that today that wall is starting uh, to shake. And I think also our conception of truth is changing with it. So when you say truth, again, you can say, You know, again, if you go to Latin, you say veritas. This is a kind of a transcendent notion of truth based on authority, on discipline, on expertise. I prefer to use verification, which is a truth practice, which is contingent, uh, which is made and remade with, from multiple perspectives. Again, a combination, the way we produce our cases is a relationship between the, the victims themselves, activists that are with them, scientists that volunteer with us, Uh, artists that are able to maybe give it a film, filmic form, the institutions of the law, ICC, Human Rights Watch document, and the institutions of the art where we need to bring that thing to the public. And what I'm calling for is exactly not to think of art as a contamination of truth. 
So to say, if you show in a gallery, therefore what you say must be fictionalized. I think that the, a conception of aesthetic practices need to be an, an, an augmentation of our aesthetic capacity to understand the world, to sense it and to register it. Uh, and it is quite a, it, it, it's a position that gives us problem because um, about half a year ago, a uh, forensic architect was nominated for a big art prize in London in recognition of our exhibitions, uh, and we lost clients because they said, oh, so are you artist? So decide, are you artist or scientist? We said, no, everything that we do is about fusing back art and science. So you need to fight that. You cannot give it up, even if it's going to be sometimes strategically better for us to throw our artists under the bus and say, we, we have no artists, there's nothing contaminating our fact. The bigger point is that we need to think about truth production, i.e. about verification differently, and we need to bring uh, aesthetic practitioner into the art of verification. Thank you. Herr Professor Gabriel. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just a comment on um, like a certain twist that might be helpful for your way of uh, um, you know, explaining the project. So maybe there's, there's another way of establishing middle ground. So if you think that, uh, you know, because you seem to be using the term fictionalized in such a way that you're granting too much territory to the kind of position that you're rejecting, why not say that fictionalizing is a revelation of truth trivially because it tells you something about the way in which someone imagines something. Mm. And this is what you do in all processes of verification. As I see you from here, my brain is creating, creating a visual illusion because there's no way that you're smaller than my hand, right? I can cover you with my hand from here. So my impression of you as visually smaller in my subjective visual field than you are is fictional. Nevertheless, this is my only way of knowing that you're there. So why not say, right? Why not give up the idea that fictionalizing would be in any kind of tension with the truth? I think there's, there's a stronger case to be made just in, you know, in, in favor of you know, like a different kind of ontology. And just a short comment on the notion of truth. I think you know, we, all we need is what philosophers now call the deflationary theory of truth, according to which you know, a statement as is true if and only if things are as the statement says. Right? So London is, the, is a city in the UK if and only if London is a city in the UK. So truth is extremely simple. So part of the post-truth uh, climate is very bad philosophy, very bad philosophy, because these post-truth people tell us that truth is extremely complicated, right? I mean, who could ever know the truth, etc. While truth is extremely simple, right? Simplex sigillum veri, as Schopenhauer used to say. So the simple is the sign of the truth. So maybe we should reverse it and conquer even more territory and give up the idea that fiction is, you know, a term that is defined as absence of truth. I think this is already a bogus notion of fiction. No, I think, I, I mean, this is, this is a fabulous series of points, and I'm grateful for it. I wish I would be able to take notes. Um, but what I want to maybe offer back is the fact that we are in a situation where truth is a battleground. Um, and whether you call, you know, that which is not true fiction, or whether you call it a lie or post-truth, you still need to be able to, to, to convince and um, conv the art of convincing is opening the way in which we work. So if a traditional forensic scientist working with DNA would simply give you the answer and you would rely on their authority to believe or not to believe, we do not have this privilege. Every step of the work that we make, all the craft, the digital, aesthetic, scientific craft that we do has to be open. There's, it's an open, some kind of open source work so that we can actually say not all statements are equally false or equally true, but that there is a way in which cross-referencing and verification make some claims much more likely and also say that lying is violence in that field. Because it's not simply a sort of a veneer of representation over what happens in reality, post-truth is an attack on people and things. It's what enables the perpetration 
or physical violence. It's, it's kind of like a hate crime in a sense, uh, if you like. So we need to also, uh, I think, step back from a certain kind of relativism, which I'm sure you didn't, you didn't mean at all. I'm, I'm, so, so in a sense, we need a spade. We need, a, we need something to do two things, to build our cases and to open up and show what are the cracks and fissures uh, in the statements of governments, for example. So you have a kind of a positive and negative relation to statement. Uh, and therefore, you know, education in the critical humanities is essential because we deconstruct government statements, etc. So all those people that say, oh, the post-truth era is the, is the fault of Derrida or, you know, Deleuze or whatever, uh, is rubbish because, the, first of all, it's not at all related to that, and maybe they're bad readers of that that just simply use this uh, relation, but you absolutely need to have a critical relation to media, a critical relation to language in order to understand and tear apart um, the kind of falsities that power is emanating as a form of violence. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Wir haben noch zwei Fragen, die bitte ganz kurz sein möchten, wenn es geht. Uh, it, it might sound boring, but um, what is the organizational and institutional takeaway from your experience? Because uh, what is, I follow you as a curator, artist, artist group, university affiliate, but what is forensic architecture legally, practically? Is it an NGO? Is it the university department? You talk about clients. Is, so okay. what can be learned? Which institution could okay. be built to develop the next forensic well, architecture? I think, I, think, I think you should really uh, look at Goldsmiths, which has always been a hotbed of kind of um, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary kind of education in the humanities. It's a university in London. It is very famous for being very political, very experimental very much connected to the arts and um, with a student body that is extremely up in arms in kind of politically on, on all sorts of issues. And uh, the fact that they were able to um, promote us in a sense, to give us legal status, we are, you know, when you peel everything, we are in university consultancy, right? Um, and we are funded by ERC, which is a European Research Council grant. We are funded by Human Rights Grant. And we're funded by selling our work uh, to museums. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, it's a very schizophrenic uh, kind of thing. In fact, our art sales are now more than what we raise in, in human rights. But every penny that we get from the art sales goes just simply back into the system. So it's a way of operating. I mean, we. We run with a budget of about, I'd say, almost a million euro a year, not more. Um, we are about 15, 20 practitioners. Um, again, archaeologists, coders, journalists, um, architects, artists, lawyers, etc., working together. Mm. Uh, when we say client, is that the necessity of our work is that we need clients. So people come to us and they say, we, we have this problem, we don't know the truth about this or that domestic or international issue. First, we'll evaluate, is there a human rights dimension to it? And if there is, we'll price it. And we would say, well, to know the truth will be 76,000 pounds. And they would say, 76,000 pounds? Well, you know, they bargain us down. And I mean, it's, it's a business. It's not a business in a way that it is, but there is, you need to run it as, as a thing in the world. Uh, all our clients, we never take money from governments or corporations. We only work for civil society group. We only work for human rights cases. But uh, we need to, 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 to run our operation. So that's hence you have clients. And they range from the International Criminal Court in The Hague to um, pro bono work that we do for communities. And we work now in the US on police violence, which is also um, just working very close to communities suffering that. Vielen Dank. Herr Linders, mit der Bitte um eine ganz kurze, ja, hinter Ihnen schwebt das Tele äh, Telefon. Uh, hello, How, um, I, I work in theater. How do you deal with the knowledge that there are so many, many more cases in the world that would need your analysis 
than you can do? Is it like symbolic politics? Should we, or would you create from your nucleus of 15 practitioners 150, then 1,500, so it's something that can spread, like a network yeah. or like a rhizome? I, I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want it to appear as disrespectful, but there's so many plays in the world uh, that we need to perform, etc. So how do we choose our cases? Uh, and I think that we, when, when the, um, a group of survivors, families, and activists uh, of, of related to the NSU case came to us, they said, you know, we have 10 murders, we want you to investigate all of them. And we said, look, you know, there's, there's no way we can do it. Let's choose the one case when we can open up the, the story from it. And this is usually our tactic. We are trying to look for uh, a micro-incident that within it, uh, all the players and all the dynamics of a certain political situation exist. So we're trying to, you know, kind of like make a little chip or a little crack in the system there and hope that social movements or activists on the ground would take that bit of information and would move it uh, forward. We also take very little cases and invest enormous amount of time and resources in them because we want to open the imagination and the possibility for other people to work. So, yes, we can grow because right now we can choose one case of 10 out of 10 uh, commissions that are coming uh, to us. Um, but I, I'm worried about this growth also. I think that we should work as a laboratory that kind of invent new techniques and then we go to places and we teach our techniques and we share it. We not, don't keep anything uh, proprietorial and we want it to be a field rather than a practice because it, if it moves as a field, it doesn't have a center. It doesn't have, not everything need to go through, through us. It just simply becomes a kind of like a possibility for artists to be in the world today. Of course, there's many other things that one can do with art and should do, but um, this is one. Ich werde zum Schluss auch noch eine Frage stellen. Wir haben hier einen kulturpolitischen Diskurs. Das heißt, wir sind auf der Suche nach Leitlinien für eine Kulturpolitik der Zukunft. Es ist gut, einen Blick von außen hier zu haben. Deswegen ganz zum Schluss auch mit der Bitte um eine kurze Antwort. Was ist Ihre Message an die Kulturpolitik? Wie können kulturpolitische Rahmenbedingungen diesen Herausforderungen begegnen? Oh, I mean, this is, uh, it's kind of, I'm not sure how qualified I am to answer that, but I think that as, um, if, I'm, if I'm answering that from what I would like to see from the political level is trust in initiatives that kind of actually come from the ground. Um, it is very hard to engineer those things. Um, but when you have, as you do have in Germany, one of the most robust digital culture and uh, sort of like people that are fighting for privacy and for especially digital privacy that is an inspiration for all of us, no? And, and I think that actually getting tuned to those uh, local indigenously grown phenomena and allowing them the space and the possibility to grow is much better than kind of thinking from above of how to uh, already reorganized the university. At Goldsmiths, we have a, a disciplinary structure to the university. There's sociology and there's art, there's this, there's that. But everything that actually happens, happens underneath that level and gets connected and flows between those um, departments. And I think that with us, it's a kind of, it's a very productive incompetence. I mean, now speaking about British incompetence, you all understand what, what we're talking about, uh, just looking at the news. But it's an incredibly creative, um, when you have an incompetent system of government, local initiatives become very powerful. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's <a> good advice. <laughs> be bad and they will be good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So...